Chapter 24, Genetics and Genetic Diseases. So genetics is the scientific study of heredity and genetic codes. These are the inherited traits that can produce a disease. The mechanism of gene function. Genes are independent genetic units, also known as DNA segments, that carry genetic code. Genes dictate the production of the enzymes and other molecules in the body, which in turn dictate the structure and function of a cell. Here you can see a picture of a chromosome coming from the human body. So we have human body, it's made up of cells, which is made up of genes. The human genome which is right here, is the entire set of human chromosomes. There are 46 in each nucleus of a cell, and then there's one mitochondrial chromosome. This 46 human chromosomes is what we care about, though. The genome contains about 30,000 genes and some additional non-coding DNA cells called pseudogenes. These pseudogenes are either ones that are not used or are edited out by RNA before they're used to make proteins. There's genomics, which is the analysis of a sequence contained in the genome, and also the Human Genome Project, which is what developed that um, human genome that we saw earlier, which is currently only a rough, a rough draft of the human genome as genetics are still being studied frequently for further and better understanding. For genomic information can be expressed in various ways. So this is just how we depict the way a gene looks. There can be an ideogram, which is the cartoon of a chromosome showing the center of the um, centromere as a constriction and there's a short segment, the P-arm, which you can see here, and a long segment, the Q-arm. Genes are often represented as their actual sequence of nucleotides, which are expressed by letters. The letters are A, C, G, and T. Don't worry, I don't expect you to remember that. The distribution of chromosomes to offspring. Each cell of the human body contains the 46 chromosomes, except for your gametes, which if you remember correctly from the uh, reproductive chapter, are the sperm and the ova. Each of these cells produce just 23 chromosomes, and that's because they need to join together to make one full human chromosome that'll be used to start the production of the new life. At conception, these two join, and that's what makes the complete human genome. These 46 human chromosomes are arranged into 23 pairs according to size and shape. 22 of these pairs are called autosomes, which means its partner is almost identical to it. The remaining pair are called the sex chromosomes. For genetic variation of offspring, this is really related to the fact that half of the chromosomes are from one parent and the other half are from the other one. And there is an independent assortment of the chromosomes during gamete formation. So that means each sperm and each ova in the two sets of parents has a different set of chromosomes. So Half of the offspring's chromosomes are from each parent, but they can be any one of the chromosomes from each parent. There are, though, hereditary traits. These are normally either recessive or dominant. Dominant traits have effects that appear in the offspring. So dominant traits, which are normally expressed in uppercase letters when we're talking about genes, are the ones that we can physically see on the outside. Recessive traits have an effect that does not appear, even though they carry the gene.
And those are normally represented by lowercase letters when we're talking about genes. A genetic carrier is someone who has a recessive gene but does not show it because it's being masked by a dominant gene. So if somebody has a dominant gene, that's what will be expressed. If they have two recessive genes, then the recessive gene will show. If they have one dominant and one recessive, the re dominant gene wins. They could also have a co-dominant gene, which means there are two or more genes that are both dominant, which means they appear together to produce a combined effect in the offspring. So now let's talk a little bit about sex links, linked traits. So we've mentioned these a few times throughout this course. There is a large X chromosome, which is the female chromosome. This con contains genes from the f for female sexual characteristics as well as many other traits. There is also a small Y chromosome, and this is the male chromosome, and it only contains genes for male sexual characteristics. This chromosome are paired with the number 23 and are either displayed as XY, which represents male, or XX, which represents female. There are a lot of non-sexual traits that are carried on the sex chromosomes that are called sex-linked traits. So here you can see Mom is XX, so when she has an offspring, it will either be X or X. Dad is XY, which means that they split, which means he could donate either an X or a Y. If he donates an X, it combines with mom's X to make a female. If he donates a Y, it combines with mom's X to make a male. This slide is showing what happens with a sex-linked trait. So this is something non-sex related, but it is attached to, to that last chromosome. So that little dash, little hatch mark on the X represents the trait. So mom has a 50-50 chance of passing it on. If she does and dad donates an X, his X acts like the dominant um, gene and overshadows this, making her a carrier, but she will not show the trait. If dad donates an X and mom donates a normal X, produces a normal female. She doesn't have it, nor does she carry it. If mom donates her X that carries this trait, and dad donates a Y, produces a male because it's XY, but it produces a male that has the characteristic because he doesn't have another X to act as the dominant trait. This is because the Y gene only contains traits for the male um, reproductive organs. It doesn't contain the normal genes to act as a dominant gene over whatever the sex link trait is. But if dad donates a Y and mom donates her normal ovum, it means that the male is normal. So this here is actually representing colorblindness, which is normally a, a male dominant disorder, and that's because it's sex linked. In order for a female to have it, dad would also have to have it. Because if dad had it, that means his ex that he gave would also um, contain the little hatch mark that meant that it was color blindness, producing a color blind female. So genetic mutations, these can result in an abnormality in the genetic code, which is then expressed as a disease. Most of these are believed to be caused by mutagens, which are agents that cause mutations. The mechanisms of a genetic disease is a single gene disease that results from an individual gene. Could be a group of genes as well. And these can be passed from generation to generation. Or there could be a chromosomal disease. This results from a chromosome breakage or from a disjunction, which means it fails to separate during formation. So, 
One that's a single gene is one that's passed on, where chromosomal disease is just a problem with the reproduction of that chromosome. So this is, will not be passed on. Examples of chromosomal, chromosomal diseases are trisomy or monosomy. Trisomy is when there's a chromosome triplet instead of just the pair. Monosomy is when there's a single chromosome instead of the pair. So here's an example. So let's say for this one, mom produces two here instead of one. So they didn't separate. Dad submits the normal one. That creates trisomy. Or here, there was disjunction, which means the chromosome that should have been in the ovum to use for reproduction couldn't pass forward. So dad submits his one, creating monosomy. So there's only one chromosome here instead of two. Some example of single gene disorders. So remember, single genes are the ones that can be passed on and are hereditary. There's cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is the recessive autosomal condition characterized by secreting very thick body fluids. These are things like mucus and sweat and gastric juices. The problem with this is that it often causes an obstruction of things like your gastrointestinal system or your respiratory system. Normally, these people have severe respiratory problems due to the thick mucus in their respiratory tract, develop a lot of GI issues because they're unable to secrete GI fluids in order to digest their food. There are oftentimes obstructions and other complications with their GI system. Another one is PKU, which is phenylketourea. This is when there is a um, this is a recessive autosomal condition where normal normally there is an excess or where it creates an excess of phenylketone in the urine, which is caused by an accumulation of um, phenylalanine in the tissues, which can actually cause brain injury or even death. Another example is Tay Sachs disease, or TSD. This is a recessive condition involving the failure to make a subunit of an essential lipid processing enzyme. So that would be an enzyme that helps you break down fat molecules to use. This causes severe mental retardation because fat is necessary for life. And normally causes death by the age of four. Currently, we do not know how to create a synthetic way to process lipids, so there's no current treatment. For chromosomal disorders, an example would be Down syndrome. This is caused by trisomy of chromosome 21, as you can see here. And this is characterized by mental retardation and various structural defects, most common of which are cardiac-related. There's also Klinefelter syndrome, which is caused by the presence of two or more X chromosomes in a male. So it's a trisomy XXY. This is normally characterized by long legs and enlarged breast tissue. Normally there is some mental retardation, very small testes, and sterility, as well as some very chronic pulmonary disorders. Turner syndrome is called, caused by monosomy of the female X trait. So there is only one X chromosome. This is normally characterized by the immaturity of sex organs causing sterility. It's because it's kind of only half the gene here. We need another X to complete the female reproductive system. Causes short stature, webbed neck tissue, cardiovascular defects, and normally learning disorders.
So understanding, preventing, and treating some of these genetic diseases. There are a few ways that we normally track genetics. We can do a pedigree, which is a chart illustrating the genetic relationship over several generations. There are Punnett squares, which is a grid used to determine the probability of somebody inheriting whatever the genetic trait is. Or there is a karyotype. A karyotype is the arrangement of the chromosomes, normally done in a photograph, which is used to assess and detect an abnormality. So this is an example of a pedigree. So when doing a pedigree, totally white would normally be normal. Blue would be that there's something wrong, and the half and half means that they're a carrier. So if this was colorblindness, dad would be colorblind, mom would be a carrier. And then you could track how it traveled throughout the generations. Punnett squares, you would take the gene in dad and the gene in mom, place one of each of those letters above one of the four squared Punnett square, and then you could predict it. You would take mom's P, dad's P. Mom's P, dad's P. So you can see here, mom had one lowercase p, that one's lowercase, which means that whatever this one is, Right here we're talking about PKU, so mom and dad are both a carrier. So PKU is recessive, so this means this is the PKU trait. The capital letter is normal. So capital letter, capital letter, carrier, carrier trait, so recessive trait. So this one would be totally normal. This one and this one would be a carrier because that's where there's the one lowercase p and the one uppercase p. So one uppercase p, one lowercase p. But then this one, this 25%, actually has the PKU gene from both parents, meaning that they're at risk for having it. So if we're going to produce a karyotype, the first thing you have to do is get a sample. There are a few ways to get a sample. One way is to scrape cells from the cheek and look at them, or to get a blood sample where you can assess the um, genes in a white blood cell. You can also get a sample from an amniocentesis, which involves the collecting of fetal cells that are in the amniotic fluid via a syringe that is inserted through the uterine wall guided by ultrasound. Or you can also do a chronic villus sampling, which is when you um, collect embryonic cells from the outside of, um, of the chloronic tissue. And that's um, through the cervical opening. And this would be a picture of an amniocentesis. Um, you can see where that would be the ultrasound machine to guide the needle. A few cells are extracted with the syringe so that then they can be looked at to look at the karyotype. So how do we treat genetic diseases? Um, most current treatments are actually based on relieving or avoiding the symptoms rather than a cure because it's very hard to change genes that are already forming and reproducing. So there has been a lot of studies on gene therapy, and this manipulates the genes in an attempt to cure whatever the genetic problem is. Most forms of gene therapy have not yet been proven very effective in humans and are still being studied. One of them is gene replacement therapy, which is when you insert normal genes so that the normal proteins can replace the abnormal proteins. There's also gene augmentation therapy, which is when cells carrying normal genes are introduced into the body to help augment the production of the normal proteins that are needed. And that brings us to the end of our genetic lecture.